And welcome again uh, for a presentation by Belinda Coldwell and Ashlyn Rolauer on the role of families and supports of adults with an eating disorder. And I imagine there's a number of carers out there that are delighted to hear us talking explicitly about what we can do to help our adult loved ones with an eating disorder. So let me talk a bit about Belinda. Prior to joining Eating Disorders Victoria, Belinda was working at the Victorian Centre of Excellence in Eating Disorders as a carer consultant and project manager, developing new strategies and resources for effective, greater and more effective care inclusion in eating disorder treatment models. Alongside that, Belinda did part-time consulting in a range of primary care, not-for-profit and other settings. Belinda was a founding board member and was the vice chair of Eating Disorders Families Australia, and that's where I met Belinda as we worked on that board together. Belinda was also vice chair of FEAST, and Belinda is the current FEAST advisor. Now, I believe, I know that Belinda is an avid paid-up rugby league supporter, um, some of you will have to forgive her for her team being the Melbourne Storm. She has shocking taste in music, being Johnny Cash, Bet Midler's all right. Um, and she's addicted to genealogy, having traced her family back to 786 AD in Norway. That is unusual, Belinda. About Ashlyn. Ashlyn uh, is a lived experience with eating disorder and is passionate about sharing stories of hope to support others in their journey of recovery. Ashlyn has tertiary education in mental health nursing and psychology and currently works as a mental health nurse in the public health sector. And previously she volunteered for Eating Disorders Victoria, having co-facilitated support groups for both carers and individuals with an eating disorder. In 2017, she spoke about her lived experience at the At Home with Eating Disorder Conference in Melbourne. Just a reminder, our attendees, to put your questions in the Q&A panel. We, we haven't been particularly good at getting to them because there's been so much good information coming from the presenters, but we will do the best we can. Belinda and Ashlyn, can I hand over to you? Um, we look forward to hearing the presentation. So a quick introduction, Gordon kind of gave us a very generous introduction, um, but um, I'm going to introduce myself and then Ashlyn's going to introduce herself. Um, I'm primarily, and have been, well I mean I've been a parent for 28 years now, but um, I'm a parent of a daughter who is recovered from uh, an eating disorder and um, I say that up front because a lot of what uh, we're talking about today stands off not only of my own experience, but of the experience that I've had in a whole range of contexts over the last seven years um, of working with a wide range of carers um, here in Victoria uh, and through FEAST uh, at various times. Uh, currently, I'm the CEO of Eating Disorders Victoria. I took that role on last, um, the end of last July. Um, I'm also, I've remained a FEAST advisor. Prior to that, I was a FEAST board member and have been for many years and um, an EDFA board member, like Gordon alluded to. Um, but also professionally, I was a carer consultant at um, somewhere called the Victorian Centre of Excellence in Eating Disorders, um, which is one of our publicly funded services here in Victoria, in Melbourne, Victoria, where we are. If hopefully you can see my background. I've got Blinders Street and a tram uh, happening to indicate where we are. Um, yeah, so I guess, and in all of that work um, at SEED, I did over 130 consultations with individual families and um, developed resources for services, etc., cetera, um, around how to engage with carers. So I guess that's what some of this work is standing on the shoulders of. Uh, okay, Ashlyn. Hi, my name's Ashlyn. Um, I'm coming today with a lived experience with an eating disorder. Um, I was lucky enough to have an amazing supportive family that played a really important role in my recovery. So I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you all. I'm currently a mental health nurse and I'm working in the public sector. Um, and I love working in mental health um, and psychology. It's been a real passion of mine um, working over the last couple of years. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to speaking and, um, and learning learning from everyone today. So thank you. Excellent. Okay, let's get going. I guess what we're talking about, a lot of the presentations I was here for um, most of this morning's and I just caught um, the one on the different therapies just before this. Um, and 
you know, sometimes we can um, spend more time talking about the role of carers in um, the care of a young person with an eating disorder. I think FBT really drove that forward um, because it placed families front and centre in the treatment of an eating disorder. But I think what we are really um, seeing that the situation um, for carers of adults um, is on the one hand, certainly in our system here in Victoria, can be really traumatic. Families often feel excluded. And on the other hand, when families are involved, it can make a difference. So um, that's kind of the premise that we're coming from for today. So we're going to talk a little bit about the rationale for family and partner and carer involvement. Um, talking a little bit about carer distress because I think it's something that needs to be put on the table um, and acknowledged um, because often it can feel to us carers that people are being a bit glib about what's expected of us and that you know this, this work is hard and sometimes not acknowledging that. Uh, some of the challenges of the carer role with um, someone who um, it's certainly in our system here, becomes an adult at 18 with a whole lot of different rights and responsibilities um, uh, at that point. So some of the challenges. Um, and then we'll go through a range of practical uh, ways carers and supports can be involved. And in the middle of that, you'll hear from Ashlyn um, about her personal story. I just want to acknowledge that while I now work for Eating Disorders Victoria, um, Quite a bit of the information for this presentation has been drawn from a document for adult eating disorder services on working with families and carers, which was developed at the Victorian Centre of Excellence in Eating Disorders. It was a piece of work that I undertook. Um, so I want to acknowledge um, SEED's support of that work in the first place, um, but you know, their IP on some of this work, some of this information. Okay. I've got several screens going here, people. So <laughs> if, I look, if I'm looking in a different direction, um, why do adults with eating disorders benefit from support from carers? Traditionally, in eating disorders, once someone is over 18, um, services and clinicians have predominantly interacted with the person with the eating disorder, and carers have been a little bit of an, after, an afterthought. Sometimes there's been work that's been done to um, support them, so um, help carers cope with the impact of the eating disorder on them, um, but it hasn't necessarily veered into the how can these, how can we use families and carers as a resource um, in this journey. The egocentric nature of anorexia nervosa, I'm talking about all eating disorders, but I'm, I'm in this instance now talking about anorexia nervosa, can make the person with the illness very attached to their illness, um, which makes it really difficult for them to have motivation to recover. And on top of that, the behaviours that one has to interrupt and that cause intense fear are linked to behaviours that one has to do several times a day in order to recover. But these can be really hard to commit to using internal motivation. I, you know, there's a whole range of things that I do that cause me anxiety that I avoid like the plague. Uh, and if I was having to, you know, get myself up and focused on um, doing them every day, um, I'd be challenged with it too. If one continues to restrict or engage in eating disorder behaviours, there can be serious medical, psychological, social consequences. We've talked a lot about that today. And Bulimia and nervosa and binge eating disorder can also benefit from behavioural interruptions at times, in times of urges and structured support around the person. So we really are talking about all eating disorders, not just um, anorexia nervosa. Uh, okay, now. Yeah. Um, who are these carers slash support slash family members? If you've ever sat around a um, a research group or a policy group around eating disorders and carers. Everybody argues about what we call them. Americans say caregivers. We've got, so we've got caregivers, carers, supports, family members. What, uh, who are these people? And really for the adults, we often talk about parents and family members with young people because young people predominantly are living at home. Um, the once we get into the adult space, it, we are really extending that out. It can be anyone. It often is still parents. Um, for a certain number of people, it's partners, sometimes siblings, uh, close friends. 
And it starts to become about the function of that person, not about their sort of designated title um, in someone's life. The, um, the person, they do need to be trusted by the affected person, not the eating disorder. So um, they may not necessarily be someone the eating disorder thinks is a great person uh, for them. Um, but they do need to be, there need to be a level of trust by the affected person. They need to be present. It's really something that's really difficult to do from a, a long distance. Uh, although I, I'm not underselling people who are supportive of people from a long distance. Um, but I guess what I'm talking about today probably is more focused on, um, on those that are uh, present. Um, that they care for the person and they're invested in that person's health. And... I think ideally for eating disorders, because of the nature of the behaviours that you're really trying to support someone with, um, living with that affected person is really ideal. Talking about parents specifically here, um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I will have spoken with parents who were being told when their young person was 17 and a half that they were going to do SBT, they, you know, their person was incredibly unwell, they needed to be admitted to hospital, you know, um, if their heart rate was less than 50 and it was crisis and that the parent's job, as you've heard today, is to get, um, you know, get really in control of this and, um, you know, move it forward quickly and parents are seen as absolutely central. 12 months later, they're 18 and a half, the parents are not seeing any difference in the level of illness of the young person. Um, but they are quite often by our services being taken to take a really different approach. Hang back, step back, just let the system do what it does. And often, um, I don't know for other systems, but for our system, the markers for say a, an emergency hospital admission are quite different for an adult than they are for a young person. So that can be incredibly scary for parents as well. What we are saying is many young adults are still well integrated in the family system and we, or this could be an option. We often see young people return home from something like university. Um, many young adults are still financially dependent on their families and families are still highly invested or feel a strong sense of responsibility for their well-being. I'm the now, now parent of a 26-year-old and a 28-year-old. Um, and I can tell you, it's just like now, it's only been maybe the last few years that I'm really starting to, you know, not feel so invested on what are they doing? Are they doing well? How are, you know, how are their lives? Are they happy, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say that goes completely, but it certainly is still quite intense from about 18 to 25. However, notwithstanding age and living circumstances, many families remain involved with their person with an eating, de eating disorder for much of the lifespan. We do see for people who have long-standing eating disorders, uh, reduced working capacity, anxiety, challenges in managing key life stresses, um, and sometimes impaired health, which can make the person with an eating disorder very dependent on family members. So the rationale for parental involvement in adolescent AN Anorexia is intended to address the motivational deficits inherent in anorexia. This is a quote from Stephanie Knatz, who you just heard from in the previous session, um, and the unique egocentronic nature of this illness. Likewise, motivational deficits and egocentricity are issues with adult anorexia and may be improved by the enlistment of carers to manage and oversee initiation, and the, et cetera, et cetera. I think I've just put the quote in there. Um, because it's really saying what many parents experience. We don't, we don't see a difference in how this illness is playing out in this person between, you know, 17 and 19, um, or, you know, even 25, um, and, but we're being asked to respond in a very different way. We can really still be closely involved in providing some of that structured support. The parents are often very committed still and really ideally placed to play an active caring role. Um, and often, particularly in the intense phases of an illness with an adult, the care required could be likened to other hospital in the home models. I don't know if other countries or jurisdictions have hospital in the home models, but we use it a lot in Australia, uh, where the carer is trained and supported to provide similar care to hospital, allowing the patient to sort of re-engage with normal life as much as possible. Um, 
Um, carer distress, um, as I said, I just want to acknowledge it. The research is absolutely clear that carer anxiety, depression and stress levels are all very elevated in an eating disorder caring role to the extent that it exceeds levels found in any other mental illness. And I think that's, um, I think at all times we need to just keep coming back to that and that if any of us as carers falter, feel like we're failing, um, you know, this is a ridiculously hard job and there's no point in blaming yourself. Carers experience these effects proportionately to the acuity and duration of the illness. So if someone's really unwell or they're unwell for a very long time, the carer distress is much higher. Um, and actually research is now coming out that recommends routine mental health assessment for carers. And I really hope that any carer out there um, of any age group really, but of an adult, that you do really consider your own mental health I would have no shame in having had counselling along this journey. I've had antidepressants at various points. Um, this is all perfectly human. Um, but what we do know is that by reducing care or distress will lead to a reduction in both the patient's distress and eating disorder pathology. So I've got links to the various research there. However, there are challenges and the big one that comes up every single time is confidentiality. Um, it just is, um, it's, it's more, almost like the first hurdle we hit every time we say parents and carers and family members and husbands and should be involved in the, in the treatment of someone with an eating disorder, people go, you know, they, you know, they put their hands up. Um, bar but however, barriers are often perceived more than real and often can be the default stance of the clinical team. And there's a whole lot of work that um, has been done certainly here in Victoria, um, which is really about um, reorienting our public services to respond to carers uh, and also to, while honouring the person's entitlement to confidentiality, presenting the um, the involvement of families and carers to that person as something which is going to help them with their recovery. And so um, rather than saying in the first appointment that they might ever have or in the assessment appointments, you know, do you want someone, you know, your family involved and if so, who? Um, often people's default stance, particularly with an eating disorder, but I don't know, Ashley might say, I reckon this actually goes across a number of mental health areas. There's a lot of shame, there's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of feeling that I should manage this by myself um, and that it is weak to rely on my family members. Um, and so often the young adults, um, first thing out of their mouth is no, I don't want my families involved, I don't want my friends. We also know that often with eating disorders, um, eating disorders thrive when everybody's on a different page. Um, so where they are saying, um, you know, I don't want that person to know and I don't want that person to know. Um, often the eating disorder is really thriving in that. We know, I know a number of really great clinicians, um, both in the public system and in the private system, and they set up expectations with clients in the first appointment um, that family care involvement will assist them to help the person most effectively. So they kind of start off the whole therapeutic relationship with the person saying, listen, we know with eating disorders, involving the support people around you um, will make this journey uh, much more effective and efficient. And the thing is, if someone says no the first time, we, a lot of clinicians don't do, if someone says no the first time, they can say, okay, I'm going to honour that now, but I'm, I'm going to come back and revisit that in a couple of weeks or in four weeks or six weeks. And we're going to keep having that conversation about how we can involve your families. Um, in our context, we have something called the Office of Chief Psychiatrist, which um, sort of oversights our public um, mental health services. Um, and they have a very explicit working with families guidelines, which involvement and getting client patient approval for this and has examples of how people can do it. Um, the other challenge which often is parents, I certainly have veered away from this one because I don't want it to be parent blaming or any of these things but what we see with adults is um, where the illness has been going on for a long time. So if it started in adolescence and now we're talking someone's 25, 26, whatever. Um, 
the, there's a lot of complexities that start to happen in that whole family um, dynamic. We often see shared traits. I know in my family, of course, I'm the cool, chilled person and I'll blame all of the anxiety, compulsivity traits on my husband. Um, but, you know, I can see that play out in my family that that makes things quite um, difficult at times um, because, you know, we also ourselves have some traits that affect how we're interacting with our um, adult. We often get see unhelpful attributions, which is probably a bit of a clinical sounding word, but really this is where we start to play these things out with criticism and hostility and guilt and shame because we are so you know, frustrated and angry at how this has all come out um, that that is how we can react. Um, over time, especially with a long-standing illness, families can adapt around the person with the eating disorder. They can lose patience. And we often see that they actually lose connections. You know, I've gone into um, adult inpatient units and we're talking about families and carers. There'll be people who really cry because they've lost that connection with their family. And that is, is tragic and, um, you know, shouldn't happen. But it's human, you know, when it happens also with things like um, drug use and things like that, we see once these things go on for a very long time, everybody just ends up getting jack of this. Um, these are all normal and people are able to come back from and start afresh with them. Okay, Ashlyn, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Linda. That was great. Um, it was really nice to hear that intro to start off with. Um, so my name's Ashlyn. Um, as mentioned before, I'm currently a mental health nurse um, and I'm working in the public sector and um, I come today with a lived experience with an eating disorder. So I've shared some pictures up on the slide with you because I'll be speaking about my family um, throughout um, this talk. So I thought that was really, it was nice to just put some names to faces. So um, my journey with my eating disorder um, started in my adolescent. And what you said, Belinda, about um, being um, that 17 and a half year old person that is diagnosed with an eating disorder, that was um, something that happened for me. Um, so I ventured up to the Victorian College of the Arts thinking that I would start my journey as a, um, as a dancer um, at, tertiary, at, at a tertiary level. Um, and very quickly, my eating disorder um, became in control. Um, we know with eating disorders, when they're put in new environments or there's change or there's challenge ahead, it's, a, it's an environment for them to thrive. So very quickly, I became quite unwell and, um, and I came back to the family home. So at 17 and a half, I'd moved out of home and I'd moved back quite quickly. Um, and that's when I was um, formally diagnosed with uh, eating disorder. And um, my family certainly... Um, came into battle with me to help um, that journey. So I was 17 and a half um, and I was back in the family home. My brother was studying in high school. He's younger than me. His name's Lachlan. And um, it was a very new dynamic for my family. Um, I've, I've always thought about eating disorder almost like a pie chart. So at that point, I felt like none of me was in that pie chart. It was completely my eating disorder and it was fully consuming. And all of a sudden I had new relationships with my family members um, and I could see that the relationships that they had with me felt very different as well. I certainly felt like I had a lost connection with my mum and my dad, who previously I was really close with, and, and with my brother because it, was, it felt like my eating disorder was constantly fighting against these people. Um, and I certainly found, um, felt very distant in the, in the family home um, despite how much love and support I was being given. So I, um, during that period of time, I turned 18 and I think it was a week or two after my 18th birthday, I was admitted into a private um, hospital and for the next two, two years, I was in and out of um, private hospitalisation for my eating disorder. But certainly throughout that period of time, my family um, supported me in, in every way they could. I was really lucky that the facility that I was admitted to um, encouraged families to be in support and encouraged families to be present. Um, and but it certainly it was up to me um, what capacity I, I wanted them to be there um, during ward rounds and um, you know weekly um, weekly meetings I had the opportunity to invite my family to come um, or not to come um, and certainly um, more often than not I did want them to be there because they had been such a supporting and, and loving um, supporting and loving to me um, 
when I was at home, I it was it was really um, mum and dad certainly had a big adjustment, but they had a team around them that was helping. So they certainly were supported by um, the psychiatrist that was seeing me and um, uh, their own psychologists or counsellors that was also supporting the family. Um, the things that I found really helpful in the family home when I was um, at home and recovering is um, is for mum and dad they and my brother to separate myself from the eating disorder. So if I was um, if I was engaging in in eating disorder behaviours, it was um, it was spoken about the eating disorder behaviours rather than about me. So that was something that was really helpful for for me in my recovery journey um, for for that conversation and that dialogue to be created. Um, Mum and dad were also really honest with me as well during my recovery and um, and if, if they were struggling or if they were having a hard time or or um, there was a there was a really honest dialogue, which I think is what created that really trusting relationship and that trusting dialogue within the family system. Um, and we also celebrated the small wins as well, which I think was a really positive thing that we created in the family home. I also, um, because of that support that they gave me, I was able to hand over a little bit of the control and the trust to mum and dad, but it certainly took, it took months and it took a really long time for me to build that confidence to be able to hand that, that, that control and, and that support over. Um, also as well, role modelling as well. As Belinda touched on before, in some families, sometimes there's different behaviours or there's different complexities that can occur um, with, with different family members. So role modelling what, what positive um, healthy eating and, and healthy exercise looked like was another thing that the family really, really worked on. Um, certainly I was really lucky in that sense that my that my family were my, my core supports. My mum, my dad and my brother were absolute core supports for me. Um, but certainly it was messy for a really long time. And I think because we embraced the mess, we called we called it the mess and we embraced the mess and um, we we all supported each other and we went into battle really together. Um, in my opinion, it was it was always more um, more beneficial um, to, to fight this illness as a team, as an army, rather than just as one. And I certainly felt that support. Um, my mum used to use an analogy where um, similar to the to the learner's plates and the um, probationary plates that when you're learning to drive. Um, she used to say, I want to, it's, it's like we're both in the car together and you're learning how to drive again and I'm just going to be in the passenger seat for a while um, and every now and then you'll have to fill up the car with petrol and you'll have to get back in the car and we'll keep the journey. And she used to say, I promise you that the, that the destination will be worth it. Um, and as you build up more confidence over time, you know, I'll, 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 I'll let you drive on your own without me in the car. And then as, uh, the more confident you get, the more that, that I trust it, that you'll be in control of this and you'll be confident to do this on your own. And that was similar to my recovery. My mum was with me no matter what. She sat, she sat by me and she, she almost taught me again how I can do things myself. And she taught me to have confidence in me having control again. And that was a really powerful analogy just from my mum. Um, and and we, we created that dialogue with each other that, um, that if there was um, small relapses along the way, I could have that conversation with her and say, look, I just think I need someone to sit by me for a little while again. Is that all right? And, and that, that um, trust and that support was there again. So certainly along the way, um, I had that support from my family um, and more recently I had a, a small uh, lapse as well and I, I'm currently engaged to my partner Harry and, and it was a new opportunity to have my, my eating disorder back um, after being recovered for six, seven years and now in a, in a different space, in a professional space, um, handing over that support and, and, and getting some support from, from someone else other than my family. So I guess I've had the experience of having support from my, my mum, dad and my brother, more as a 17, 18-year-old, and then more recently having support from, from my fiancé um, in, in my professional career. So um, certainly... It's, it's been two different experiences, but because of that, that trusting dialogue, I think that I developed um, when I was younger, um, it certainly allowed me to have the trust and the confidence to be able to, to get my team around me again and, and realign the team. Um, my, my dad also gave me another analogy, which I think is really important to share too. Um, and I'm sharing these analogies because in, in my recovery and my experience, 
the two things that I remembered from 10 years ago weren't from my psychiatrist, they weren't from my psychologist, they weren't from my dietitian, but they were from my parents. Um, and to me, that just proves the pivotal role and um, the important role of, of a parent or a support person or a carer in the recovery for an eating disorder. So my dad took me down to the beach um, and he sat me in the middle of a hill and he said to me that um, we were taking stock. Um, and it was a moment for me to see if uh, he, he wanted me to sit in the middle of the hill and say, we can either go up the hill or we can go down the hill. And the thing with the hill is the more, the more that you incline the hill, the steeper it is to climb up and the quicker it is to fall down. And this analogy showed me that, that what I was doing, my recovery was taking time because the incline was so steep, but it was so worth it at the end for the view. And, and I really feel those two analogies, they're things that have stuck with me and it just shows the, the closeness and the importance of, of having my parents and um, them to support me throughout my recovery. Um, during my, when I was at home as well, um, my, my parents reminded me of what my strengths were and what my traits were away from my eating disorder. And that's something that my partner did as well. So creating that dialogue or creating that conversation about strengths, oh, I really love your creativity or I really love your determination. Creating that dialogue and reminding that person of what their strengths are and what their unique traits are um, away from their eating disorder that can be used to provide strength and provide hope as well in their recovery. I think the thing that I learned from my family being involved with my support um, in my recovery is that closeness doesn't always come in proximity. Closeness can be su a supportive conversation or a trusting conversation that you had historically that you still feel that closeness. Um, and I still feel that closeness when I think of those analogies now, um, 10 years later. I also learned that it's important um, as a family to not let the eating disorder be the shadow in the corner, to bring it to light and to talk about it because the more that we're scared of something, the more um, that we're fearful of something and we don't look at it, the bigger it becomes. And that was really true in my family. The more that I looked at it and the more that we spoke about it and the more that we brought it to light, the less I became scared of what was happening to me and the more I was able to be in control and the more I was willing to fight these battles and, and develop the life um, that, that I wanted to have without my eating disorder. And my parents really always remained curious as well and my partner certainly did as well. And that can come in, in the form of um, getting support for yourself or speaking in peer groups. And like Belinda said before about carer distress too, um, it's really, it was really important for them to, to get support. So, um, so that, was, that was something that really hit home to me was ensuring that my family were also supported because it was really hard what we went through. And, and as a family, um, we went through so much together, um, but from, from having support and working through the mess, um, it was certainly worth it. So, yeah, I might hand back to you now, Belinda. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ashlyn. I, you almost don't need me. You've just kind of said a whole lot of it, probably a whole lot better than I will ever say it. So um, thank you for that. Um, no worries. And I, I'm very conscious of time now, but um, I'm just going to go really quickly. I believe these um, slides, these show, these slides are going to be available afterwards. Um, so don't worry too much about all the text. Um, I deliberately put all the text in because I thought um, there will be people who may read the slides only and never hear the voice. Um, but I guess, what are the key areas that we can as carers be involved? One, first one is assessment and treatment planning. Right from the get-go, um, families and carers have such rich information to give a treating team um, about who the person is without their eating disorder, what are the things that motivate them, um, etc. Uh, and so it's a really key thing. And then when we're planning about the treatment planning, if you involve, if families and carers are involved, you can um, uh, you can be a part of the um, you know making decisions about the right right path and what's going to work for this person, for your young person, or for your partner, wife, husband, every everything. So. Um, a sort of another key role um, is something called uh, which is meal support. Uh, we talk about this a lot in the young people, but this is actually a critical role for carers um, of adults. It may look a bit different um, in that it takes on um, sometimes that meal support needs to be um, talked about collaboratively between the families and uh, negotiated collaboratively. But eating and from choosing what you're going to eat through to sitting with the distress post a meal 
is a really complicated activity for someone with an eating disorder. And there are ways that carers can step in at the different levels. So they can be supportive of our menu planning. They may do food purchasing. My daughters um, did really well in over two years in SBT. Um, then she had, I call them wobbles. And my daughter doesn't have relapses. <laughs> the word relapse makes me panic. Um, wobbles, I feel like we can get some containment around that quickly. But she leaned back into us, exactly how um, Ashlyn just talked about, hey, can you just sit alongside me for a bit? Can you, can you just make all the main, main meals for a while and I don't have to think about that whole evening meal thing? So families need skills also at, at the meal table support, coaching um, and information and support often on the increased um, and often significant nutritional requirements. So it's not innate for families and carers. So families and carers, if you can get your head around the nutritional requirements and have the conversation if you are involved or ask to be involved with the dietitian around what all this looks like. Um, I've put at the bottom there a... Um, uh, a, web, a new website that just started a couple of months ago. It's a fabulous series. Um, there's two courses on there, one for families doing FBT and one for families supporting adults with an eating disorder and it's all about meal um, meal support. So it's a bit of a how-to. Um, so that's a great, um, great website and resource. Um, the other key role, I mean, we did this as much as we ever did the meal support staff is the interruption or distraction from uh, eating disorder behaviours. Sitting alongside someone post meal, um, if you've got a person who um, uh, feels the need to purge, you know, sitting with them, watching TV, distracting them, those sorts of things is incredibly helpful um, as a carer of an adult. Um, at times, this is more related maybe to the, the younger adults, um, but families can be able to use leverage in terms of redirecting unhelpful behaviours. Um, so in my case, my direct experience, um, we're not paying for gym memberships in this case. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it, it's not something that's you know, on the list of things that we're going to do. Um, but, you know, you can restrict access to phones. We also, at times, when we felt our daughter really wasn't mentally very well, we restricted her access to the family car. Yeah, I can relate with that, Belinda, as well. I just thought I might jump in, as, and that was a really important one as well, is um, if I wasn't, um, you know, if I was engaging in eating disordered behaviours and I wasn't safe to be on the roads, then it would be really important for mum to keep me safe in that moment and to take that away. So that's a good point to make. The other thing that families can do, and there's been some conversations in different sessions today, which is really about looking at emotion coaching and communication strategies. Um, so I've put a whole range of things there um, and a couple of links to website. But the Collaborative Care Skills Workshops, Janet Treasure's workshops are very helpful in this context. Um, there's also um, some great videos on that emotion focused family therapy um, website, um, which actually coaches you about how to change how you're having the conversations. And I, I again, I personally um, found these incredibly helpful. Um, boundary setting um, is so important as carers and something that we don't think of, that it is okay. Partic now, particularly with adults, we don't have to, you know, we are entitled to have a family life that resembles something of what we like a family life to look like, um, that, you know, we are entitled to have some boundaries and what we can find with carers of adults, particularly ones that are living at home, have been unwell for potentially a long period of time, the families have completely melded everything and so they just do whatever it is that, um, that the eating disorder person needs because that need is so intense and anxious and so everybody's kind of, you know, wriggling around um, trying to accommodate it. Um, and it you know, recognising how distressing some of this stuff is for our loved one, but it's still okay to say, I can't live in a house that has a whole lot of screaming and yelling. And I get that you're anxious, but it's okay. You know, you find a way to manage your anxiety in a way that doesn't mean my house is taken over by screaming and yelling. And that's an okay thing to expect. Um, and then finally, just talking about support. For carers of adults, it's just as important that you access um, support for yourself as um, for carers of young people. For services, when I'm talking to services, I'm saying it, in any treatment plan, there should also be a plan for in, ensuring the ongoing resilience and mental health of the family support network. If we don't ensure the, their ongoing resilience and mental health, they can't be there for their loved one 
for the length of time that's going to be needed. Um, accessing online face-to-face -face peer support um, based on a range of a whole lot of organisations, including my own. Um, access mental health assessment for, um, so actually getting a mental health assessment for yourself as a carer. Let's check in, make sure we are as resilient and robust as we can be for this. Um, and what we often find is completely neglected that family members and carers may need grief and trauma support. This is, and, and if you don't talk about this or acknowledge this, you can have family ripples for years where everybody does a knee jerk reaction about this. I'm sure Ashland's maybe got some examples of that. Uh, certainly in my family where, you know, the daughter that had the eating disorder who's doing really well, she still only has to kind of you know, not feel like lunch for everybody's hackles to go up and have this kind of grief trauma response. And particularly where someone's been unwell for a long time, you know, you're really grieving what that person was going to be and, you know, the the life that you dreamt for them, you know, may not be panning out. So, um, yeah, so that's just some ideas. And I think I've run out of time. Gordon. Belinda, you crack a whacking pace there as you move through those. Sorry, I galloped through yeah. them all. <laughs> no, fantastic. You've covered it off and I'm really thrilled to hear you making those slides available. The carers um, tuning in will be thrilled by that. Uh, monitoring the chat, there's a lot of interest I um, mean, both what you and Ashleen have had to say. Look, I had some questions, if I can put them to you as, as best I can. Um, we've got about 15 minutes to work through these. Um, so let's just see what we can do. So I appreciate you going fast in one way because it means we can get to some questions this time, which we haven't been able to do very often. Um, the first question is, um, if you've got an adult with an eating disorder, um, how, there's two parts to this question. What, if they're not engaged, if they're not receptive to being in treatment, what are the options for engaging those, uh, those people? Um, and there's two parts. <clears throat> the two parts to this are one, if you do have leverage, such as some financial leverage uh, with the young person or with the, the adult. And the other one is if you have no leverage, they're totally independent, live independently, support themselves independently, um, don't need you for any resource type things. Um, is the question clear? Look, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I've, you know, uh, worked with several families um, over the years, particularly when I was at Seed, that were in exactly this position. Um, look, it's a really tough one. Th this is where it gets really tough. And I think the people end up having to make a decision. And I think it, it matters whether someone is a fairly young adult and what type of level. I don't like the word, I do like the word leverage, but I actually think of it's more like corralling someone towards health and towards treatment, you know. So how can we make a bit like sheep going through those sheep dip corrals, you know. <laughs> um, you're, not, you're not actually picking up the sheep and dumping it in the dip, but you're kind of creating a, um, a pathway um, that makes it more likely that they're going to end up where they need to end up. And so at times, um, you may need to withdraw uh, where your support is enabling them to not engage in treatment. So if you're in that situation, so if your support, um, I remember the one family where the young person had been unwell for a number of years, she lived at home, she stayed mostly at home, she was on a disability pension, she um, you know, incredibly unwell, and she really needed hospitalisation. Parents were really freaked out. Um, and they did end up having to really go, we're not going to help you um, out. She had, um, she would take masses of diuretics and she was trying to escape from the house to go and get diuretics in their local town. So the family, it was a country town, the family sort of stationed themselves outside the front of every shop that might possibly have diuretics in. Um, they actually took the engine, um, something they disengaged in the car, which actually meant that her car didn't work. Um, she then called a friend over, they briefed the friend, but they grabbed the friend at the front gate and said, look, this is the situation we're in, she's really unwell. Um, and the friend went for a walk, but she sort of came back from that and said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go, you know, in this instance. And, um, and then when she was coming out of hospital, um, she just wanted to come straight, she was discharging herself and she wanted to come straight back home to exactly the same scenario. And the parents actually in that instance for the first time in eight years said, you can't come home. You can come home or you can come home providing you eat, 
you know, sufficiently, you are not taking diuretics, you're, you know, and they listed out about five things with the kind of um, rules under which she could come back home and live under their roof again. And she, of course, she immediately went, no, 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 and went off and then eventually came back to get some tablets and then said, oh, okay, yes, I'll come home under those rules. And, you know, that was an incredible, that dad spoke to me and he was in tears because, you know, what happens if she just goes off and she, you know, um, she becomes really unwell and she's not under our roof. You know, that for a long time they'd been doing harm minimisation under their roof. So that's a very extreme example. Um, <laughs> but I think it's about what do we have at our disposal to um, encourage health-seeking behaviours rather than um, keeping the eating disorder um, sure. And Ashley, just before you respond to this, yeah, I could see sorry. you're going to say something which we want to hear from you too. But yeah. what if there is no resources that the the, the, uh, yeah. the adult um, uh, relies on or goes to from the the parents or caregivers? Any thoughts? Oh, Ashlyn, did you hear us? Sorry, can you repeat oh. the question? <laughs> So, look, Belinda's given us a great example of, of what to do with when there is, uh, the word was leverage in the question, but where there is the uh, person with the illness does require something from their family. Um, but if they require nothing from the family, if they are totally independent in every material sense, but mm. very unwell, um, what, what guidance is there for families to help that person engage in treatment? So the core of this is this all works very well when the person is engaged in treatment, yeah. but if the person just is not engaging, the, the yeah. disorder just won't allow them to do that. Um, you, you've got to get them to engage. So what are the, the guidance around getting engagement? Absolutely. And my, I, I clearly remember a conversation that my parents had with me that they said, we love you, but we hate your eating disorder. And it was almost like the choice um, was, was, was taken away, but it was still there. Um, but they the, certainly um, more recently being um, independent from my parents, um, you know, living with my partner. Um, I, I had a conversation with my mum about the fact that I thought, um, as Belinda said, things were getting a little bit wobbly again. Um, and she said, reminded me, we love you, but there's that, but we hate your eating disorder. And, and at the moment um, there, there's no room for it. So having those conversations about um, uh reminding me about the, the love and support that I had, but trusting me at the time um, that that um, trusting my ability to, to work forward was, was quite helpful. I think the for me, um, my, my parents um, versus my treatment team um, were, were very um, cohesive, um, but I was very much, um, I always drew on the treatment team and, um, and I trusted the treatment team as well. So I, I never kind of had the experience where I, I, I did push everyone away because I certainly have been help seeking. So in terms of, um, I guess, the wholeness of that question, it's a little bit hard for me to answer because I, I have been um, wanting, wanting the support, um, but certainly having the, the support and the, the guidance and the reminding from my family was really helpful. And can I just chime in quickly with that second scenario? Um, we, we see that quite a bit at EDV. Um, and I think it is still about families, A, putting your oxygen thing on yourself. And so making sure that you can still have um, considered interactions with your loved one. So you're not responding, you know, reactively um, to what you're seeing. And that you just have to keep representing options at various times you know there may be just that one time or that one moment or that one scenario where suddenly they are more likely to consider treatment and I think it's um, by trying to look after yourself and not end up in that whole thing that we often see even where everybody's at, at each other and disengaged that just you might need to be continuing if they're completely independent just to be in contact, connected. If you're not in contact or even connected, you'll never get that opportunity to to um, have a suggestion. So, I guess that's okay. for that really other extreme example. Okay, thank you. I'm sure our attendees will find that useful. Uh, the next question um, I, I selected from the list was dealing with transition from for for, for someone who is under 18 and under and being treated through, in this case, FBT 
to other treatments in the, in the child as they become 18? How do you transition from an FBT under 18 model to an adult treatment model you know, after they are 18? And I'm conscious there, just putting that number there is, is an artificial line to yep. some extent, even though it's a legal yep. one. Um, but if you guys could perhaps comment on yep. that, please. If I just go quickly first, because this for, I found this was my direct lived experience. Um, you know, I had a young person who got sick at 16. Um, she was largely better by 18, but um, wasn't 100% perfect and went on to have a few wobbles in that sort of 19 to 22, 18 to 22 period. And, you know, you asked the wrong person because I just went, I don't care if there's an 18th birthday. <laughs> you know, there was a bit to this that I, I just, if I just, I, it's part of my personality as I, if, you know, if I don't want to see that hurdle or I don't want to hear about that hurdle, um, I tend to just push it to one side. But, you know, again, this comes to the fact that if nothing else has changed other than an age, you know, you've still got a lot of what makes um, your presence as a family around that person an incredible resource. Um, the system will mess you up a bit because you will get a different response from the system than you were getting before 18. Um, but I think it's still important to hold our own internal beliefs about the value of us as a family still, you know, providing when, you know, in our case, Lucy needed us to become closer around her and provide a bit more structure when she was wobbling to we eased off again. I think the other thing that becomes tricky but is helpful to pursue is quite early on trying to get them into other um, things like um, CBT for their anxiety and you know other mental health support that can kind of maintain recovery um, in there and try to help them sort of navigate that you know a lot of people with eating disorders can struggle to you know from going oh I think I might need help to which therapist shall I ring can I pick up a phone they're, they're very adult things to do so they often tend to still need the family to find the person, pick up the phone, <laughs> often pay for the, if it's private, um, you know, pay for the appointments and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, in my personal instance, I, to a large degree, just ignored the 18th birthday. Yes, but I did hear you um, talk to the, that, I think to the intent of the, the attendee's question, um, yep. should there be planning in the pre-18 Stage oh, to and, move and, oh, so if that's the question, sessions. absolutely. And what we yeah. want to see, I often say, what we want to see is like um, a, a baton to use an EDFA motif for everything. Yes. Um, yes. But you know, a baton get handed from under 18 to over 18, where both services are holding that baton for a period of time before the under 18s let it go, so that we. You know, they transition across. That only really works if someone is still really unwell on the 18th birthday. Whereas a lot of our experience is that people, young people are unwell 14, 15, 16 or 12 or whatever, and then they have a relapse at 19. Um, so, you know, that in some ways that's not possible. Yep. Now, Ashleen, you were going to comment on that, I believe. Yep. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that um, I guess as a 17 and a half year old, we tried that FBT model um, at home and for me it... it, it didn't, um, it, it wasn't, I wasn't improving um, noticeably with that. Um, so I um, moved into the inpatient setting. But during the periods where I did come home, certainly we used techniques and um, mum adopted some of the um, techniques from the FBT model as well. So it was quite flexible throughout it. But I think it's an important thing how there is, um, you know, at 18 things really change. But in, in my family, we've, we had the conversation as the fact that at the end of the day, whether or not you're 17 or you're 18 or you're, you're 21, you're not functioning. Um, as, as you, you as can at best at the moment and you're not functioning as an adult, you're not making adult decisions um, appropriately. So um, depending on how old you are, um, these are the things that um, we do for our family. And, um, you know, mum used to also say, you know, if this was your brother or if this was your dad or if this was your mum, what, what would you be doing to support that person? So trying to see it from someone else's shoes was quite helpful too. But certainly planning as well. And um, we would have um, kind of team meetings with psychologists, psychiatrists, dietitians, um, and with the family, so everyone was on the same page. And I think, in my opinion, that's just essential. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, look, we're doing well. We've got a, perhaps room for one, maybe two more questions. Um, one of the participants has said that my adult person with an eating disorder lives in another state. Um, that's mm. what. That's all that was in the question panel. I think I'm going to infer the intention is how can I support them from a distance? Um, and we know in Australia, we, well, actually, I don't know where they're from, so I won't make an assumption around where they are. But, yes, how do you support someone, an adult person from a distance? That's a, that, I mean, it's, it's a tricky one, but I think you can. I've, again, I've seen examples of um, families who have been very concerned about their family member in a different state who um, are both keeping regular contact, occasionally fly in um, to see how things are going, um, connect. You know, there was a, a one family for, um, in the time I was at EDFA, um, it, other EDFA people will know more. Um, but, you know, there was a, a woman in Melbourne and the family were in Queensland and there was a whole lot of work that was happening. You know, the mum was doing actually quite a lot of string pulling from Queensland about, um, you know, doing her research around what services would take her daughter uh, in Melbourne, etc. cetera. Um, so it's, it, it's not impossible to be playing, but it's a, it's a hell of a lot harder. Um, and, you know, I think, and I actually think in that particular instance, if I remember correctly, um, the young woman actually in the end decided to go back to Queensland and live in the family home for a period of time. Um, and that sort of made all the difference. So, um, you know, it, it's really, really, really uh, difficult. I will say if, if the call is coming from America, I have noticed in my time that, you know, in America, people go into state. Well, they head off to college really mm. rapidly in a completely yeah. different state. Um, so culturally, yes. um, mm. that doesn't happen to quite the same degree um, here in Australia. Often people who no. go to uni go to uni nearby, etc. Yes, yes. That does seem to be something we see in the American literature is um, the, those late teenage years moving state to attend a college. Mm. Um, okay. Ashley, did you have any comments on on the issue of supporting someone at, at, at a distance? Oh, look, I don't, I don't have experience in, in that scenario, but I think Belinda answered that one that really nicely. It can be done and um, mm. we can still provide that support and care and love to someone in lots of different ways. And that was kind of what I, what I was speaking about before as well. Closeness doesn't have to be in proximity as well. We can still be close to someone and provide someone some supportive, um, yeah, supportive conversation around their recovery, supportive conversation about their future goals and hopes and dreams away from their eating disorder as well, no matter how far away we are. Thanks to technology. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, look, and in the last 60 seconds, um, Belinda, you mentioned the word boundary setting. Uh, one of our participants would like you to elaborate on what you meant by when you were talking about setting boundaries. I think it was in the context of setting boundaries in, your, in the family home is how I Yeah, I, I guess I was, well, yeah, a well, boundary is about how you're going to interact with your loved one. You know, I remember going to a great talk by, I can't remember, the name's gone out of my head um, from... Vancouver, Canada. Um, but, you know, the notion that there may be times, particularly with your adult, say, for example, you have an adult family member who doesn't live with you, who um, will come to your house, but absolutely, you know, won't eat and it's Christmas dinner and things like that. And, you know, it's okay if this is really important for you as a family to say, in our house, at Christmas, we all sit down at the dinner table and eat. I can get that that's really stressful for you and I might be able to help you with it, uh, the distress, but, you know, this is what we're going to do. But, you know, now other families will take a different stance on that or whatever, um, but I think the boundaries, I think if we feel completely at all times dictated to by the eating disorder, that completely erodes our own resilience and our ability, our ability to um, respond respond with kindness and compassion over the long term. And so just those boundaries I'm talking about are, are boundaries that for our own sanity as a family, we need to maintain. And um, you know, so a big one for me, which you know, at times we still struggle with, we don't get it all right, but no, I hate a house where people are yelling and screaming. You know, that really erodes my ability to go to work sane and do a whole lot of things in my life or even, you know, be kind and compassionate to uh, my anxious child. So um, we, um, you know, just trying to, those are the boundaries I'm talking about. Yep. Okay. Um, and would another, would another example of a boundary just be around, we, we will keep everyone in this household safe. 
uh, with that exactly. being an example yeah. of the boundary. Yeah, yep. okay. absolutely. All yep. right. Yep. Thank you. Look, we did have other questions, but I have to cut it off there because we are moving straight into another session. We don't have a break between this one and the next one. Ashley, Ashley, thank you so much okay. for your contribution and your insight as a as a lived experience person. And thank you, it's Ashlyn, not Ashleen. Um, and Belinda, as always, uh, really great hearing from the combination of your lived experience as well as your now quite an extensive career in, in supporting carers and others uh, through the, the journey of eating disorder recovery. So I'd ask all the participants to do however you would like to do a virtual thank you and applause for you. So thank you heaps. Um, thank you from Melbourne. And, uh, okay, yes.